Welcome to Timeless Truth with Pastor Jim Thomas, a resource of the Village Chapel in Nashville, Tennessee. If you don't have a church home, for those in the Middle Tennessee area, we'd love to have you join us for worship in person every Sunday at 9 or 11 a.m. Or if you live outside of Tennessee, join us at 10 a.m. for our online live stream. We're grateful you've joined us this week as we continue our study of 1 John. We pray these studies will help us think more biblically in every category of life so that we might be formed into the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's Pastor Jim. So the Apostle John was one of the closest friends and disciples of Jesus Christ. In the third chapter of one of his ancient letters, the one that we call 1 John, he says this about nurturing a healthy conscience. Listen to this. We shall know by this that we are of the truth and shall assure our heart before him, meaning God, in whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. That is, God knows all things. Beloved, and I love that term of endearment, the Apostle John using that over and over and over again uh, with the original hearers or or readers of his letter and us by extension as well. Beloved, that's you, that's me. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. And the one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And we know by this that he abides in us by the spirit which he has given us. All right, now, you may or may not have noticed, but the last sentence and the first sentence of this passage I've just read, verses 19 and verses 24, um, they have the sort of same few words at the beginning of the opening sentence and the closing sentence. The opening sentence in verse 19, we shall know by this, and then the closing sentence in verse 24, and we know by this, So John, as we have said before, is all about reassurance. He's all about uh, helping us to know that God loves us. Now, as I read that, you may have had some trouble sort of tracking with me and with what the way John has written here. I gotta say, whenever we're reading and um, attempting to understand the original authorial intent of ancient texts like this, we should expect some difficulties to emerge. Languages, word choices, sentence structures, um, nuances of linguistic interaction, um, cultural under- culturally understood metaphors, similes, and analogies, all of that stuff. So we've got a lot of hurdles that we're gonna have to jump if we're gonna be able to actually understand what John intended to convey to his original readers. Uh, Citing the 19th century theologian Robert Law, John Stott, one of my very favorite Bible teachers, calls these first couple of verses a grammatical locus vexatissimus. That's how I think it's supposed to be pronounced. Locus vexatissimus, that is, I had to look it up, a very troubled place. That's right. Um, And I do wish I had studied Latin. I would have known that a little better and how to pronounce it a little bit better. But once I did look it up, and then I reread that passage again myself, I started to see a little bit about what Law and John Stott mean by calling it a locus vexatissimus. When John says, by this, in verse 19, what is the this. Is the this what he had just said before it? Or was he saying, and by this, and then was he referring to what he says following the this? Stott essentially says it's a good question and that the answer isn't all that clear. And I so appreciate John Stott saying that and Robert Law before him as well. Um, Perhaps we interpret the answer to what John meant by this um, 
through maybe looking at it from a different perspective in a way. And I think that that, because those are like bookends, the opening uh, of, of the first sentence of verse 19 and the last sentence of verse 24, I think because they're so similar, it gives us a little bit of a clue and uh, might even lead us in the direction of trying to analyze it, like I say, from a different perspective. John mentions the term our heart four times in verses 19, just 19, 20, and 21, those three verses. What did John and other ancients mean by that term, our heart? Um, what did John's first century readers think he meant? And how about us? I mean, we're more likely to see the heart and mind as distinct from one another in our own time, but not always. We often say we feel when what we really mean is we think or we believe something or other. Um, we do our thinking in our mind and our believing is some combination of thinking in the mind and the intuition uh, or beliefs of the heart. For the people of Bible times, the heart was the core part of a human being. It connected the thought processes of the mind with the flow of the emotions and desires, the intuition of the soul, the voice of the conscience, the disposition of the will. Um, and yes, we are complex creatures. That would all imply that, wouldn't it? I guess what I'm saying is that understanding and interpreting our own thoughts and feelings can sometimes be a complex thing too. So to do that with an ancient text like this that also is from another time, another era, another part of the world, talking to a group of people that have a completely different religious background than our own. I mean, this is really, really a, a tall task. Um, John, I think, is concerned with the challenges of the our, our oft-condemning heart. Um, and the parallel challenges of our oft sinful desires. He is constantly talking about how belief and behavior go together or ought to go together and how the love of God, re receiving the love of God should also um, issue forth in our loving others and loving one another well. And so he's making all kinds of connections uh, throughout this letter we call First John. And most of us are aware uh, of the voice of our conscience. Most of us acknowledge both our moral obligations and our spiritual inconsistencies. That is that we, we know we ought to do this or that, but we also know that we don't always do this or that, or, or perhaps it's that we should refrain from doing this or that, and we know that we don't always refrain from doing that. Question then is, does John offer us any help with our sort of struggling with our conscience? Does he offer us any help with nurturing a, health, a healthy conscience before God, especially the one to whom we will all give an answer one day? And what about our contemporary mindset that says, follow your heart all the time or listen to your heart? And is that even possible when my heart and your heart may not see things the exact same way or interpret the data points of reality or, or right and wrong the same way. How do we do that? And at the same time, uh, as I say, you know, for the, the insight I think he's trying to offer us is about how you nurture a healthy conscience before God in particular. So the struggle is that sometimes when my conscience speaks to me, it's right. And sometimes though, it could be wrong. Um, sometimes it's being informed and influenced by family or cultural norms that may or may not align with God and God's word. And sometimes what I assume is the voice of my conscience is actually the voice of the accuser of the brethren, Re Revelation 12 verse 10. Um, the enemy of our souls who's constantly trying, called the accuser of the brethren because he's trying to accuse us. You're wrong. You're wicked. So it's interesting that uh, the enemy of our, of our souls is constantly trying to lure us into sin. And then once that works out well for him, he immediately begins accusing us of, <laughs> our, of the sin that he lured us into. So as you can see, we're, we're complex creatures, aren't we? And uh, I think that's why it's so important that we have this book and the Holy Spirit helping us 
to learn to discern what this book has got to say to us and how it can teach us and how we do really well, as John says right here, to turn our hearts toward the Lord, who is what? Greater than our heart. Verse 20. Whatever our heart, if, no matter what our heart is saying, God is greater than our heart and God knows all things. He says in verse 20, that is so important for us to, because what we believe about God is the most important thing about us. And if you're trying to nurture a healthy conscience before God, it's important that you know what God thinks about the, virtually everything that he's revealed to us. Perhaps it would help um, and helps us to notice the activities of the heart that John refers to. Here, in, in these verses right here, if you'll take a look at the text yourself, he says the heart knows, uh, the heart can be assured or reassured, the heart can be condemned, or the heart can be condemning us, um, and the heart can also not, it can refrain from condemning us, verse 21. Um, so, the common result of all of these verbs is that we hear from the heart all of the time. And these verbs do describe how the heart is the voice of the conscience, the voice of our convictions. But it's also the voice of some of our cultural norms and the voice, perhaps, of some of our family norms. And what John wants to do is offer us assurances and reassurances and turn us back to the Lord when we're struggling to understand what it is that our heart may be saying or attempting to say to us and how it might even be confusing us somewhere along the way. The reassurance we all need comes through faith in the God who is greater than our hearts. The God who lavishes, lavishes us with his sovereign grace and rescues us from all the confusion with the saving power of this thing he calls truth. You know, Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. And so we do really well as John leads us to turn back to Jesus all the time, to turn to the Lord. The prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament said this in chapter 17, verse 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Does that mean your heart is always wrong and is always leading you in the wrong? No, 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 no. It just means that we need to be awake. We need to be aware that sometimes follow your heart may or may not be the best advice. And it's good for us as we mature to actually learn to discern the will of God in these matters. Again, going back to the Old Testament, um, a lot of you will be familiar with these verses. And by the way, I'll put them in the uh, show notes. But the writer of Pro the book of Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Okay, so trust on the Lord. Okay. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make, your straight, uh, make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. So in all cases, we will only find our hearts at rest before God, that is in God's presence. We can be sure and must frequently reassure our hearts by preaching the gospel to ourselves um, that it's the conviction of biblical truths in the mind that can assuage earthly fears in the heart or in the conscience. Isaiah said it this way, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you, Isaiah 26.3. And I love the way Dallas Willard in his book, Renovation of the Heart, if you haven't got a copy of that, that might be worth a read for you. He said this, healthy feelings properly ordered among themselves are essential to a good life. So if we are to be formed in Christ likeness, we must take good care of our feelings and not just let them happen. And see, I think that's what happens to me sometimes. Maybe it happens to you sometimes. It certainly happens to a lot of people sometimes. They, they, they take sort of the veneer approach 
Just follow your heart, just trust your heart, as if your heart is always gonna lead you in the right direction. And yet we all know that it doesn't. We all have friends who have done such foolish things just following their heart, just following their desires. Um, just like an animal, you know, like when you walk a dog on a leash and it, it's basically just following its nose as it goes through the neighborhood uh, and it can be distracted so easily. We're, there's so many of us that are that way. We are so distractible um, through our heart and through our desires. But our forgiveness from God, our salvation, they come from the Lord. If we want to nurture a healthy conscience before the Lord, we need to go back before the Lord. Because our forgiveness and our salvation, they're not based on how we feel about them or about even our deeds. They're based on what God has done and said about us and about his grace at work in our lives. There is a holistic integration of spiritual surrender to God's agenda, a motivation towards a harmonious moral response to God's commandments. That is, that we are going to align, make, put it in harmony, what we believe and how we behave because we love God and we return to the Lord, trusting his ways, trusting his understanding about what's right and what's wrong. Answered prayer, John says here, is tied directly to keeping his commandments. And that first and most important commandment is to love the Lord your God your, with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. And the motivation then flows out of that to do what is right in God's sight, not merely what is right in our own sight. So what is John's goal in writing and how does he accomplish that goal here in this little passage? By seeking to persuade us to believe in Christ Jesus. That is to trust him. That is to have confidence in Christ. What Christ has done for us um, and this offered to you and offered to me for free. Each and every day, his mercies are new. And so when you rise up tomorrow morning, whenever, whatever time it is that you get up, um, there'll be a fresh batch waiting for you. Um, and God very eager to share those with you. I love uh, the phrase. Uh, he says, this is the, the commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. And believing in the name of Jesus means that we trust all of who he is and trust all of who we are to all of who he is. And that's what it means to abide in him as well. Abiding is not simply an individual's mystical experience, but it's connected to living an obedient life in Christ, walking in the light as he is in the light, loving others as he would love others. Once again, Dallas Willard, spiritual formation in Christ moves toward a total interchange of our ideas and images for his ideas and images. I love that. So living in Christ is not a mystical experience which anyone can claim on their own, however they want it. Uh, John Stott says, it's indispensable accompaniments are the confession of Jesus as the Son of God come in the flesh and a consistent life of holiness and love. That from Stott's commentary on the letters of John. Let me close in prayer and let's go out and, and uh, walk in the freedom that this offers all of us. Father, we thank you for your sovereign grace uh, lavished upon us and setting us free from the penalty and the power of our sin. Jesus, we confess that we believe in you. We trust in you. We rest in your great love for sinners uh, such as we are. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you'd give us a heart that loves you and your commandments so much so that we delight and we are eager and excited to obey your word today and to abide in you. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Read ahead, chapter four is next and I can't wait to get into it. Thanks for listening to today's study. Take a moment to leave a review and share this episode with friends and family. You can stay connected by signing up for our newsletter or follow us on social media. At the Village Chapel, we believe God's Word is unique in its source, timeless in its truth, broad in its reach, and transforming in its power. For more resources or to support our ministry, visit our website, thevillagechapel.com.